Good morning all. Welcome to worship here in Coatesville, whether you're in the Coatesville area or in the countryside or even across the ditch in New Zealand. We are glad that you're with us. And of course, I will continue to remind you that each week after the service and after the chatting that goes on online, why do not give somebody else a call and share the peace of the Lord with them. And I'll say now, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's begin with a prayer of approach. Let's pray. Be with us, Lord, as we come together in this time of worship. Open our ears to hear your voice. Open our eyes to glimpse your glory. Open our hearts to receive your grace. Open our mouths to declare your praise. In all we think and do, help us to respond to you in lives of humble servants, ardent love, justice, reconciliation, and peacemaking. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And of course, the reason that we come together in worship is because of Jesus. And we will begin our time together this morning as we sing, All for Jesus, All for Jesus. This our song shall ever be. You, our only hope, our Savior. Yours, the love that sets us free. Now it's over to Anne who will be talking with the younger in heart. Thank you, Anne. And good morning all. I hope you're with us this morning too, Charlie. 
I wonder whether you get letters at your house. Have you got a letter box out the front of your place? I got a letter in my letter box this week. It looked pretty awful because the rain had got into the letter box and I think the snails had got in too because they'd started to eat the soggy envelope. But the good thing about it was that the stamp was still stuck on it. Because you know, if a stamp doesn't stick well, then the letter can't be delivered. It needs to have good sticky on it. I've got lots of other stamps because I like to save them. They've got all sorts of interesting pictures on them ships and houses and here's a good one I've got of a wombat. Stamps need to stick well. We call it sometimes stickability. It's a funny word, stickability. Grown-ups might say faithfulness. Faithfulness, sticking with something. Sometimes we talk about dogs as being faithful we say they are good friends and they stick with you. There's a very famous story about a dog called Greyfriars Bobby. He was a dog in Scotland and his master used to look after the cattle that came from the farms to the city ready to go to market. And Greyfriars Bobby always went with his master wherever he went to help him look after the cattle. And eventually, Greyfriars Bobby's master got so old and so sick that he died. And they buried him in the cemetery. And do you know that that little dog, Bobby, stayed in the cemetery next to his master's grave for years and years and years and years and years. And people said, isn't he faithful? He's sticking with his master, even when his master has died. And eventually they made a statue of the little dog. And when you grow up, if you ever go to Scotland, you might go and see the statue of little Bobby, the dog who was faithful. You know, we need to be faithful to our friends. We need to stick with them when times aren't so good. We need to stick with them when they're sad. Jesus wanted his friends to stick with him and sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they let him down. They didn't stick with him at all. Sometimes it's hard. Some people who've been friends of Jesus died because they stuck with Jesus. And other people said, oh, you are silly to stick with Jesus. Give him up. And they said, no, we won't give him up as our friend. And they were killed because of that. Now, I hope that never happens to us. But sometimes people might say to us, oh, you are silly to be a friend of Jesus. You can't see him. He can't be a good friend. But we know he's a friend in our heart. And we can stick with him. And that's the sort of thing that he wants us to always be. Faithful, good, sticking friends with Jesus. And there's a little song that I learnt when I was a little girl a long time ago and it goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to stick with Jesus. I have decided to stick with Jesus. I have decided 
to stick with Jesus. Won't let him down, won't let him down. I hope you'll stick with your friends and you won't let them down. And I hope you'll stick with Jesus and you'll never let him down. Have a good week. See you next time. One night during the week, Anne and I had a little discussion, we'll say. We were actually in bed and and began asking about the New Testament lesson today. And she thought it was the parable of the talents which occurs in Matthew. But the parable, the last of the parables we'll look at in this series is from Luke and it's a little bit different. And I believe it's about stickability and faithfulness. And now, Lynn, if you would care to read that for us, we'll be listening. Thank you, Lynn. Sorry, I think I didn't unmute myself. I'll try again. Right, this reading is from Luke chapter 19, verses 11 to 27. Jesus is walking from Jericho to Jerusalem. While the people were listening to these things, Jesus proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. And he summoned ten of his slaves, gave them ten minas, a mina is a gold coin, and said to them, do business with these until I come back. But his citizens hate him, hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to be king over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he summoned these slaves to whom he had given the money. <clears throat> he wanted to know how much they had earned by trading. So the first one came before him and said, Sir, your mina has made ten minas more. And the king said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very small matter. You will have authority over ten cities. Then the second one came and said, Sir, your mina has made five minas. So the king said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another slave came back and said, Sir, here is your mina that I put away for safekeeping in a piece of cloth. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You withdraw what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. The king said to him, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. So you knew, did you, that I was a severe man, withdrawing what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow? Why then didn't you put my money in the bank, so that when I returned, I could have collected it with interest? And he said to his attendants, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten. They said to him, Sir, he has ten minas already. I tell you that everyone who has will be given more, but from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to be their king, bring them here and slaughter them in front of me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it so happens today we will be having two songs by Stuart Townend, a British songwriter. And now we will join together in singing How Deep the Father's Love for Us, How Vast Beyond All Measure That He Should Give His Only Son to Make a Wretch His Treasure.
Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the snobbers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is. Sometimes it seems that the most important value that there is around today is success. But what is success? Why do we put such a high value on it? And how do you measure it? I can only wonder whether there is another measure for the quality of our lives and our evaluation. And I suggest that the parable which Lynn read to us earlier provides us with such a measure. You'll find parables, as I suggested in Matthew and Luke, that are similar but different. <clears throat> Both are set in the last week of Jesus' life. In Matthew, there's one more parable, the sheep and the goats. In Luke... There's just one more parable, the parable of the tenants who kill the owner's son. Most people seem to know the parable of the talents. Not so many know this Lucan parable. Of course, it's very close to being the climax of Jesus' life and teachings. And as such, it's important. It's part of the excitement and tension building which might well have looked like the kingdom of God is about to appear now. Context is vital to, it, to any understanding of something written 2,000 years ago in another language from another culture at a different historical period. Unless we carefully assess the context as best we can, we'll always be in danger of perceiving what we're reading through the lens of our culture, our language, our psychology, our history, our politics, our economic theories, our religion, and our military victories and defeats. The danger is always in reading what is not there. Before Jesus' lifetime, Herod the Great had gone to Rome in 40 BC seeking a Roman appointment as king. In 4 BC, round about the time of Jesus' birth, Herod's son Archelaus made a similar journey to argue the case against his half-brother Antipas. Herod had been successful, Archelaus was not, and was banished. Those listening to Jesus as he told his story knew their history and knew the way such journeys could end with very uncertain results. The outcome of any journey could be arbitrary and very, very uncertain. So Jesus' story opens with a noble man's speech to his retainers. 
He's off to a far country to receive kingship and come back. He may be confident that he'll be back, but can the retainers be quite as certain that he would return as king? He gives each of them what amounts to three years' salary. They're to trade with those funds. But the terms under which the money has been given is uncertain. There are two small Greek words which literally mean in which. Engage in trade in which I'm coming back. It doesn't make any sense in English. It could be translated as engage in trade until I come back. <clears throat> but it could also be engage in trade because I'm coming back. Those traditional times surrounding Jesus' ministry were times of uncertainty and stress. The Middle East during that first century was such a time. Who knew what the future would actually hold? I believe Jesus was saying, or having the noble say, engage in, train, engage in trade, I will be back. But could the slaves, could the retainers be as certain? Especially if they knew that there was a vocal and powerful opposition using the catch cry, we don't want this man, this scumbag ruling us. What do you do when you're uncertain about who's going to win a political skirmish? Do you openly start a business as an obvious supporter of the absent noble? Or do you do your darndest to lie low out of the public eye? Maybe the prudent thing is to go underground, burying the money under the floor in the back room might be the smart and safe way to proceed. In the story, the noble man does return with royal power. He summons the retainers and wants to know how much business they've transacted. He's not so much interested in how much they've made, he's interested in the extent to which they openly and publicly declared their loyalty to him during the risky period of his absence. He'd challenged them to do just that before he left. Now he wants to know, were you obedient? Our translations don't make that point clear. They read something like, how much did you earn? It seems our Western translations are more interested in financial success and profits than faithfulness to an unseen master in an unseen and potentially hostile world. The first of the retainers comes in and reports a 100% profit. The second, 50%. And what is it that the master commends them for? Success or faithfulness? Both are rewarded for their faithfulness their loyalty to their absent. One is given responsibility over ten cities, the second over five. Then the last, the third retainer in the story. He has hidden his money in a sweat rag. He says he's af afraid of his master. I'm afraid of you because you're a severe man. I wonder whether you realize that in some societies, suggesting somebody is cunning and devious 
or just plain hard is a compliment. Is this man sweet talking his way out of a situation of his own making? Is he trying to use what he thinks are compliments to weasel his way out of the trouble that he knows he's in? What was his rationale for what he did? Was he actually afraid of his master or was he afraid that his master would not return and that he could have backed the wrong man? and had his intended weasel compliment instead become an insult. His problem was lack of trust and faith. One of my lectures at Fuller Seminary in Los Angeles asked, what do you think the master might have done if the servant had traded the money and had to shamefacedly confess that he had lost the lot? His answer? the master would have forgiven him for his faithfulness and said, here's the same sum of money again. Go back, try again. I'm not going to make any suggestions about the interpretation of the final words of our reading. They make Jesus sound like a Jesus we don't recognize. And Luke, a Luke that we don't want to know. Yet I have to admit that Paul could say the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Yet this can be said about the ending of the parable. As with the parable of two weeks ago, it seems unfinished sentence is pronounced. The punishment is carried out or not. What will a generous master do? So is this a parable about success and failure or about courageous public faithfulness contrasted with failure of nerve? Let's be honest. Our situation is not so very different from the picture Jesus painted with words. Jesus is not physically here with us. In many ways, our God is a hidden God. We believe Jesus will come again, but in the meantime... So, what are we to do? A British journalist once asked Mother Teresa how she kept going, knowing that she would never meet the needs of all the dying in the streets of Calcutta. She replied, I am not called to be successful. I'm called to be faithful. If you know this parable, Maybe you've thought of it as, like Matthew's parallel but different version, as dealing with talents, abilities and gifts. Whether that's the way you've interpreted it or not, or whether you've accepted my interpretation, it is about the way we use what we have. But it is about whether we are faithful, successful or not. What matters in the end is our trust in Jesus as Lord and the way we live faithfully as his disciples. You are not called to be successful, but you are called to be faithful. Now I would like to invite you to join with me as we say together a prayer. God, love, unchanging. Our Father forever, we trust you. Whatever happens, we will trust you and be faithful to you. 
lonely, afraid, full of sorrow or pain, we will trust you and be faithful to you. You will not fail us, even though we fail you. You will hold on to us even when we lose our grip on you. You are utterly trustworthy. We will rely on you now and forever with Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Earlier I had said that we would be singing two Stuart Townend songs this morning and now we join together in a song which I think I perhaps introduced to you a few months ago, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. This morning, this sun. 
John asked me to pray for South Sudan in the prayers of intercession this morning as the um, Uniting World is appealing for donations. So there's somewhere else you can uh, make a donation as well as a share appeal. Um, Uniting World is the organisation that um, uh, works in collaboration and cooperation with big churches in Africa, Asia and the Pacific Islands. So it's replaced their... Um, no longer use the word mission, so it's the group that used to be in charge of missions. But this day we talk about, today we talk about collaboration with churches um, and work with these churches in these other countries. So I just wanted to talk a little bit before I started to pray about what's happening in um, South Sudan because it's difficult to pray for something when you don't really understand anything about the country. And I suspect that most of you, like me, have not, well, I shouldn't assume that, but many of you, perhaps like me, have not bothered to keep up with what's happening um, with the Uniting World. So in South Sudan, they achieved independence three years ago after a seven-year war with um, the northern part of Sudan. And in that war, about 400,000 people were killed in a population of about 7 million. So after achieving independence, then they immediately broke out a civil war in between the various warlords in South Sudan itself, because it's a very tribal country. So there was this war between all the different heads of the tribes trying to gain power, just to add to their problem. And this is eased somewhat, as the two most prominent have signed a power sharing agreement, but there's still a lot of fighting between the smaller groups within that country. As a result of all this fighting, there's a large, there are large refugee camps in both South Sudan and in Kenya, and it's difficult to provide food and water in those camps. And South Sudan seems very similar to Australia. It is prone to droughts and floods, both of which destroy crops and animals alike. And just to add to their problems in South Sudan, they have a bride price. And that means that the man has to pay money to the wife, to the family of the wife that he wants to marry. And in the villages, that might be something like 10 cows or the equivalent in goats. In the cities, it will be cash. And in a poor country where there will be many men unable to afford this price, consequently, there are a lot of women and girls who are simply adopt, um, abducted or kidnapped. Now, the Uniting Church in Australia has been working with the Presbyterian Church of South Sudan, helping to train ministers and lay people, sending them out into the um, villages with the skills to become peacemakers and working towards reconciliation. And they also provide trauma counselling. Of course, that has all changed um, because of the COVID-19, which has just added to the problems in that country. And so now a lot of their time is spent um, teaching people about how to prevent the spread of that disease. So let us pray for this country and for our other needs. Loving God, we pray for the families who have fled their homes and are living in refugee camps in South Sudan and across the border in Kenya and Ethiopia. They have no education for their children and at the moment there is very little food. We pray for women and girls in camps who must walk a long way for water and risk kidnapping, rape and violence from tribal groups. We pray for all the staff in the churches who want to return to the peacemaking work, but who are struggling both with the immediate need to share health messaging among those without access to media and with the personal economic impact of the lockdown. So the team is not only at risk from COVID-19, but they live without reliable food, water or electricity in their homes and places of work. There's also a request here for a prayer for John Muir, who is the head of the Presbyterian Church in South Sudan, because he has been transferred to Khartoum for medical treatment. Um, he's been recovering from malaria and he's in very poor health and requires ongoing treatment of stabilisation. <laughs> here in Victoria, we give thanks for the small signs of hope the numbers of uh, new cases are gradually 
slowing down, even though it is a bit up and down at different times. In our gardens and outside, we're seeing the gradual awakening of spring as the flowers gradually, the early spring flowers gradually appear and bring some to life when we walk outside. And the days are gradually getting slightly warmer so that we can get out inside into the garden. We ask for patience as we draw near the end of this lockdown. We pray for school kids who are getting tired and bored with online learning. And we pray for those who live alone and find it difficult to find a rhythm for life with so many normal activities not happening and hard, find it hard to find a motivation to do the normal thing. Be with us, God, in our waiting. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, in heaven. your name, your kingdom Lord. come, your will be done on earth done as on in heaven. Earth as heaven. Give, Give us today daily our daily bread. Daily bread. Forgive us our sins, sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our situation here in Victoria because of COVID-19 is not easy. But Lynn has reminded us that things are not easy in many other places in the world and much more dangerous. I didn't suggest Lynn pray for India, but the situation in India with COVID-19 is such that one-sixth of the people of the world who live in India are now facing the situation where the number of deaths and cases of COVID-19 is expected fairly quickly to overtake the United States as the leading area of COVID-19. So please think outside our situation and the situations for prayer in other places in the world. You've already been reminded about Holy Communion next Sunday, so please be prepared with bread and wine or grape juice. Of course, it will be Father's Day. And it's not insignificant, of course, that we begin our series next week on the Lord's Prayer. And we begin, of course, with Father. But let's now come to the end of our service as I remind you that we have been thinking of stickability faithfulness and certainly last night I was remembering with Anne a Hossa phrase from South Africa Bambalela which in Anne's period of presidency of the World Federation of Methodist and Uniting Church Women was the phrase the word for stickability so remember to be faithful to God and know that God will continue to be faithful to you. As I said earlier, we may fail God, but God will not fail us. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all today and forevermore. Amen.